Greetings, everyone. My name is Kay Simpson, and I am the president of the Springfield Museum. Welcome to our virtual event featuring Andrew Joyner, the very talented artist who illustrated Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum. We are so proud to host this virtual event in collaboration with the Hats Off to Reading campaign presented by Random House. Many of you know that Springfield, Massachusetts is the birthplace of Theodore Seuss Geisel, AKA Dr. Seuss. Ted Geisel grew up in the Forest Park area of the city and spent his boyhood visiting the Forest Park Zoo and other favorite haunts throughout Springfield. In order to honor his legacy in 2002, the Springfield Museums opened the Dr. Seuss National Memorial Sculpture Garden that features a series of oversized bronze statues representing some of his most beloved characters. The sculptures were created by the stepdaughter of Dr. Seuss, artist Lark Gray Diamond Cates. In 2017, the museums expanded our Dr. Seuss experience by opening the amazing world of Dr. Seuss Museum. The museum provides opportunities for discovery and play and also showcases the Geisel family collections. Our mission is to pay tribute to the Springfield roots of Dr. Seuss and to further the messages of hope, inspiration, acceptance, and friendship in his works. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Andrew Joyner to our virtual event. Andrew is renowned as an illustrator and author of many children's books, including The Pink Hat, The Hair Book by Graham Tether, Duck and Hippo in the Rainstorm by Jonathan London, and many others. He also wrote and illustrated the Boris Chapter book series about an adventure-seeking warthog. His books are now published in more than 25 countries. Andrew is joining us from his home in South Australia where he lives with his wife. Please join me in welcoming Andrew to our virtual event. Well, thanks so much, Kay, for having me. Thanks uh, everyone at the museum for welcoming and making me part of this event. I'm really thrilled I could be here. Um, I wish I'd been able to visit the Springfield Museum. I've only been to America really twice and for very short periods of time, but I hope in the future I can uh, visit the museum one day. Um, so I spent all my life in Australia. Uh, and, you know, when I was a kid, I really loved uh, Dr. Zeus. Um, and like a lot of kids in Australia, um, you know, even today, Dr. Zeus was, was very popular and was very popular when I was a kid. Um, I was in the 70s in, it was in the like, mid 70s in Australia when I was a kid. Um, and I've even got some of my childhood copies of Dr. Zeus here, Green Eggs and Ham. And, um, oh, there's some more. Horton Hatches the Egg, remarkably well preserved, that copy. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is it was kind of surreal when, you know, 45 or so years later, I was asked to illustrate a Dr. Zeus book, having loved Dr. Zeus as a kid. And one thing I noticed when I was working on the Dr. Zeus book with the Dr. Zeus's Horse Museum is that I think there was some subliminal influence on my work just because I loved Dr. Zeus as a kid. Um, when I was young, I always drew and I like throughout all my life, I've drawn pictures. Um, but I, and one of the ways I learned to draw was really through copying. Um, and I can't find any pictures I drew where I copied Dr. Zeus, but I'm sure I did because I copied virtually everything. I'd see cartoons in the newspapers, cartoons on TV, just pretty much anything I saw. Um, but I do wonder when I was working on the book, if there was some sort of subliminal influence of Dr. Zeus's drawings on my own work. There's something about his line. I don't draw like Dr. Zeus because I don't think anyone can really, but I do feel like um, he sort of influenced my work in a small way, maybe just through my love of him when I was young. Um, so yeah, I became an artist, an illustrator, kind of almost accidentally. Um, I didn't study art I stopped studying art halfway through high school. 
but I just always loved drawing. Um, and so I drew through school for like the student newspaper um, at uni where I was studying English literature, which I think is also like Dr. Zeus was studying English literature. Um, I was drawing for the university newspapers and things like that. So I just, I just guess I learned to draw just simply by drawing. Um, I never really thought of it as a job. I was kind of, I was probably in my mid twenties and I was doing, uh, attempting to do a PhD in English literature, kind of miserably grinding my way through it. And my wife, we'd only just been married. My wife said to me, you should try illustrating. Um, so I sent some work out to newspapers and magazines, not to publishers at the time. Um, and eventually I got work working for newspapers, some magazines here in Australia, some in America. And I did that for quite a few years. Um, until probably I was nearly 40 when my first picture book came out. Um, and again, that was almost accidental. Someone, uh, an author called Ursula de Bozarski, uh, an Australian author and quite a well-known author um, in Australia, saw some of my work in a magazine and thought I'd be good for this picture book she'd written uh, called The Terrible Plop. There's a copy of the book there. Um, and uh, so, I was nearly 40 when I did that. That was the first picture book I illustrated. And there's a weird Zeusian connection with this book too. Um, Ursula's now currently the Australian Children's Laureate. Um, and I actually saw her speak uh, the other weekend at our Adelaide Writers' Festival here in South Australia. And a child asked her, Where, when did you know you wanted to be a writer? And Ursula's about my age. And she said, when I was six, because I really love this Dr. Zeus book. I had trouble in getting Solar Salu. Um, and I'd read the book all the time and I decided that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be the person who would write stories like this. And the terrible plot is probably, she's done loads of books. This is probably her most Zeusian story because it's rhyme, it's got a kind of Zeusian feel to the rhyme. So I thought there was so, odd, like a weird synchronicity that there's a connection between my very first picture book, which I did about 10 years ago, um, and later working on Dr. Zeus's books. Um, I also, one of some of the other odd connections, I think Dr. Zeus also studied English literature at uni, uh, at university or college, um, which I did um, rather than studying art. And so I guess I'm self-taught a little bit like him. I'm not saying I'm up at his level at all, but um, I, kind of think there is a, some connection between studying English and um, illustrating because illustrating is a bit like it's kind of a form of reading where you're creating pictures that have to be read um, so I think studying English does have an impact of course Dr Zeus is a writer as well and I think of myself more as an illustrator but I think studying English did actually help me rather than um, being a hindrance or like irrelevant to what I ended up doing. Um, so I did, I've been illustrating for probably the last 10 years. And now, ever since I did that first picture book, nearly all my work is in children's books. Um, and so it was probably, uh, like when I was, I was probably coming towards nearly 50 when, um, I was approached about working on the horse museum, Dr. Zeus's horse museum, this book here, um, now, I didn't know this at the time, um, but I gather Kathy Goldsmith, who was the art director on this book and the art director on many of Dr. Zeus's books, uh, she um, contacted, uh, she um, first came across my work uh, in this book here, The Pink Hat, um, which isn't a, which I wrote and illustrated, and which is actually about the Women's March of 2017. Um, so it's, it's not, I don't think it's especially Zeusian, but it, um, there's something in that work that Kathy saw that she thought would be great for um, tackling this uh, unfinished manuscript by Dr. Zeus. Um, and I'm glad she did, because I, yeah, I couldn't really believe it when um, I was asked to do it. Uh, the first contact I had on the book was actually a non-disclosure agreement. Um, 
And I don't know if it's a cultural difference or a publishing difference, or I've just worked at a much lower level for a long time, but that was the first time I've ever had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and so I, it was about 24 hours where this non-disclosure agreement came through on email, which I had to sign before I was even shown anything to do with whatever the book was going to be. And I was trying to guess what it was. Um, and I couldn't really imagine that it was a doctor's, I couldn't believe it when it came through. And I was looking at this unpublished manuscript by Dr. Zeus. Um, I've got to say, it was a really great experience working on the book. Um, I thought when it was first offered to me, I would, you know, I desperately, because I love Dr. Zeus's work, I really desperately wanted to do it. But I, I did have some apprehension that it would be a really difficult project, like a very, like micromanaged project or whatever, and really difficult to be creative with it. But that wasn't my experience at all. I worked with a really small group of people at Random House um, and at Dr. Zeus Enterprises, and they were all really focused on making it a really creative experience. And I was given an incredible amount of freedom, really, and it just seemed to all come together um, quite nicely, mainly because I think there was a lot of great work mm -hmm getting the manuscript together for me. And there was just, yeah, Kathy Goldsmith at Random House and Alice Janitis at Random House and Mallory Law and, um, and Susan Brandt at Dr. Zeus Enterprises. They just really made it a really good creative process and gave me a lot of freedom when I was working on it. So, yeah, and it was also, I mean, I felt really honored to be working on this book. I felt like there was a real responsibility to get it right, but I didn't really want to focus too much on that when I was illustrating this book. Um, I didn't really want to think of the gravity of the, um, the uh, project when I was working on it, because I also, I, I really wanted to focus on having that creative freedom. And if you're worried about, you know, what the response is going to be and things like that, um, that could sort of hinder you and, um, well, for me anyway, that can hinder me. About this, one of the many things I loved about working on this book was I guess working with all the artwork. Um, and I actually found it was, um, I actually learned quite a lot just working on the book about all the different artwork that Dr. Zeus had um, incorporated into his manuscript. And you know, it was actually, the manuscript itself was really quite complete. Um, it had sort of, he'd written as far as the writing went. Um, and there were some changes made in the selection of artwork as we were going along by the editors as we were making the book, but not hugely. Um, he'd sort of finished at modern art, the modern art page. And you can see there. Um, but he'd sort of said at that point, you know, continuing on to examples of um, surrealism, expressionism and things like that. But... Uh, like Alice and that, and uh, Kathy did a great job of pulling all that together. Um, what I love about the book as well is it's, I think it's such a clever idea about how to connect um, art to children, to just focus on something really uh, simple and small, like a horse, and look at how a horse has been used to, been approached by different artists throughout history and use that as a way of explaining art history to kids and to adults too. It really helped me understand some things about art too. Um, it also, I gotta say working on the book also made me look at the artistry of Dr. Zeus himself because I didn't really, I didn't think I could totally imitate his art style or I didn't think I'd do, it would work if I just tried to imitate his art style, it'd be too stilted or whatever. And, that's almost the opposite of what Dr. Zeus's artwork is. It's very energetic and it's got such spirit and movement to it. But I did sort of pay attention to, I guess, how he composed his work. Um, there's very few actual right angles in his book, in his compositions, which I thought might provide a challenge when you're design, like drawing a museum because there's walls and frames and things like that but they sort of provided a nice restriction I could uh, bounce off and sort of create more um, kind of slightly Zeusian compositions. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot about his work 
that is it's, it's deceptively simple, really, I think. Um, Dr. Zeus's artwork, it looks, I guess, really direct, um, but and I guess really clear, but that's also what makes it um, so difficult to achieve. Well, that's kind of the genius of his work, really, is that he can communicate in such an original way, but so directly, so that, the, you know, so many children, so many adults, only children around the world really love reading and responding to his work. So it's, I think it's clear that he did have some, a really good understanding of how art works too. And that's why I think this uh, book is, like the Horse Museum was such a terrific idea for a book and why he had such a clear idea for visual literacy as well as, um, you know, his work on other forms of literacy. So yeah, so while I said um, Dr. Zeus is very hard to imitate, I did draw some Zeus characters in Dr. Zeus's Horse Museum. And that was so much fun to do, to put a few characters in there. And I've got to say, when I read the book to kids, um, they love spotting the Zeus characters hidden in there. Uh, so I'm now going to do some drawing demonstrations, show you some drawing demonstrations about some ways to draw uh, some Dr. Zeus characters, like the cat in the hat, um, and the Lorax. And I'm also going to show you how I was really influenced by the cat in the hat in creating my ho the horse character there, which is kind of the narrator that guides us through this horse museum, this museum of horse art. Because um, I tried to get some of the spirit of some of Dr. Zeus's characters and drawings into this character. He's almost like an avatar for Dr. Zeus. You can see it's kind of a secret of a reference. Hard to see, but there's a little drawing of Dr. Zeus at the bottom of the page there. Anyway, so now you'll see some quick tips on how to draw uh, the cat in the hat and the Lorax, as well as the horse from the Horse Museum. Okay, so I'm going to start drawing the cat in the hat by using some really simple shapes. Um, you're welcome to draw along. My tip is, when you start drawing these shapes, draw them quite lightly to start off with. I'll draw them a little bit darker so you can see what I'm doing, but you know, I can rub them out and that's what you can do as well. Um, so I'm gonna start with kind of a drip for the body. We'll do a straight line there for a leg, bent line there, I'll look at a line for the ground. Do another sort of little shape up there for the head and one for the arm, one for the arm there and a bit of a hat all the way up there. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. Now that's sort of just a rough guide for how I'm going to draw my cat in the hat. And I'll change some of the shapes like the body's a bit big. I'm going to start, and I'll do this darker, and I'm just going to start by sketching out where I want some of the more detailed parts of the drawing to go. So like Dr. Zeus, so I use those shapes as a bit of a guide, and then I draw a straight over the top. And I'll draw it really quickly because then I can refine it a little bit as I draw over the top. And I'm drawing the cat holding a book and that hand come down here where the leg is, another leg there. So really much like Dr. Zeus, I draw and draw again. In this case, I'm doing it straight over the top on the one page. And I'll do another arm here, like that. Mm, getting a bit of conflict there. So I'm gonna do, an umbrella in the hand there, a tail down there, handle for the umbrella there. 
I've there. Okay. So those sketches, now I'll now draw over the top with a darker line and I'll start here up by the yeah, zigzag line there. We'll do necktie there. about the cat in the hats hat is it moves almost as much as the cat. Um, dots. Now let's do the body um, here. That. There. So we'll just do the outline first and I'll add, add a bit more detail. So I'm doing like kind of zigzag furry line for the outline of the cat. Some gloves there and the hand down here for the body. Down to the back. The tail, I might use the squiggly line. The moment. The doctor's excused himself. This leg here. Not a squiggly line like that. For the foot. And this other leg behind the body. Like that there. This is my umbrella. That handle and for the book. Excuse me, I just stepped on something. Uh, that doctors that the cat's reading some stripes on the hat. Here we go. Okay, so now we have kind of an outline. I'm just going to add a little bit of shading to it. Use kind of a bit like the squiggly line that Bazus used in his roughs. I love the way he cross hatches his drawings. I think it's beautiful. But I'm going to do a quick few. And the trick is not to fill the whole picture in. Not to fill all of your cat in with dark, but just to use a little bit. Just to help give it some form and shape. If you're using a pencil, you might want to do a different style. You could do it much slower than I'm doing it. This is my big fat pen. The time. And here's a leg. Get darker there. Okay, there's my other pen. There it is. Yeah. Oh. Or the cat there. Here. 
here. That. Go and let's do a zigzag along the ground. I like that. Okay, so we've sort of got a cat in the hat there. Okay, and we just started with a really simple squiggle. Might do a little squiggle on the hat. And yeah, maybe a little bit down there. Oh, and I might add a little slogan here. Hats off to there we go. Managed to squeeze that reading in. Fantastic. So that's the cat in the hat. Okay, now we're going to have a go at drawing the Lorax. In the same way we drew, oops, the same way we drew the cat in the hat, um, we started with some really simple shapes. The Lorax is good though. The cat in the hat's pretty tricky. I'll admit there's pretty complicated shapes. There's a lot of drawing in the cat in the hat. The Lorax is quite a bit easier because it starts with a really simple shape. Let's try the letter U. It's not even a shape yet, it's a letter. The letter U. To make it into a shape, I'm going to do another upside down U at the top there. And we've got kind of two U's joined together, kind of an oval, I guess, but flattened a bit on the sides. Now, it looks just like something floating in space. Let's add a couple of lines or legs, one there, one there, a line there, just so I know where it's standing. Then we've got to do a moustache. That's what the Laura has got a huge moustache. Let's work out where we're going to put that. We'll make a little circle there for the nose, and then a couple of big lines out like that to help us work out where we're going to put the moustache. And back to the middle there. We might have a little mouth there couple of eyes there, some circles for eyes and some little thin lines for arms. We might make that, I do that in a slightly different position, more like that. So these are just shapes and lines that are help, going to help me draw my Lorax. Now I'm going to quickly sketch a few more details over the top. So we need like a big furry line for the Lorax's moustache. Little nose there. So a bit of a zigzag there for the fur. Maybe some lines here. Beautiful, gentle eyes for the Lorax. Some lines for eyebrows. Cute little mouth. Let's do a little arm there. So those lines just help me. They're like a little guide for it there. And slightly thicker legs on the Lorax. There. Now we're starting to see Lorax. I might do it now with a dark pen over the top. Sorry, I walked away from the microphone. I'm going to use a darker pen now over the top. I'm going to start right here in the middle. My little nose. Do the eye there, another eye there. Something different about Dr. Zeus is he draws the pupils like little U's, which is not how I normally draw pupils, but 
I'm going to draw on this time. There's our big mis Lorax moustache. And over this side too. And an adorable little Lorax mouth there. I'll just do the top of the Lorax's head like that. Those fun spiky eyebrows there. Little arms, little hand like that. Another one here. There. And we might do a little bit of a furry line there. Down to this leg. Little foot. There. And across here. Like that. Then I might rub out a bit of those lines there. If I were just a guide for my drawing, those pencil lines, so I can rub some of them out. And then let's add just a little bit of time to a little bit of shame. Catching here, across the middle side, front to sit on, go. Yeah, more there. And that's looking pretty good, I think. So you can see we drew the Lorax by starting with a really simple shape or just a letter. A U, maybe another upside down U on top to make our first shape. Thin lines for the arms, thicker legs, two ovals there for the eyes, little dot for the nose and sort of for the mouth, and then a big furry moustache. And there we have the Lorax. Like that, great, thanks. Okay, now one of the interesting things, well, for me at least about the cat in the hat is that it was an inspiration for the horse character I created for this book here, Dr. Zeus's Horse Museum. Let me find a picture of the horse. There. The button looked like it, but I'll show you very quickly. If I draw the horse, you'll be you'll be surprised at how close it is to our cat here. In fact, I can start with the same drip shape, the same long line for a leg, another leg there, the ground. I'll do a longer neck and a different shape for the head, arm there, arm there. Okay, that's all the shapes I need to get started. Oh, maybe a tile. There we go. So I'm going to use these shapes to start making, sketching out my horse head there. And like the cat in the hat, it's got a bit of a necktie there. Big long legs down to a horse, a belt across the middle, and there. 
And another leg back here. That. And keep an eye there. All right, now it looks a bit like a mess of schools. I'm going to draw over the top with a darker line to do a course. Sorry about that bang. Here we go. That. Horse head, a nostril there, an eye there, an ear, another ear, a neck down here, a collar there, bow tie. That and out here, shape of my pen, drawing too fast for my pen here, a hoof hand there, another one here, Yeah, all the way down to this leg, down there, and line there, poof, there, there we go, pants there, do another line there. For the leg. Let's, I'm going to get a thicker pen here and we'll do a tail. We go there and we'll do a bit of a mane. A bit of a wild mane. This horse here. Now, the reason I was inspired by the cat in the hat is that I wanted the horse in the horse museum to have some of the energy of some of Dr. Zeus's characters. One of my favorite is, of course, the cat in the hat. Such an amazing character. Built there. That's a very quick drawing, a bit of a squizzy line for the ground. And there we have a quick drawing of the horse from the Horse Museum. And if we go back to our old drawing of the cat in the hat, we'll see a bit of a connection. You can see how some of the same shapes we use, those long sort of hose pipe arms and legs, that drip body, just a slightly different head. So hopefully some of the spirit of Dr. Zeus's artwork is in this character as well. Because that I wanted the Horse Museum to be not just a tribute to artists, but a tribute to the artistry of Dr. Zeus as well. Okay, thanks guys. Cool. See ya. Thank you, Andrew, for that wonderful tutorial. My name is Maggie North, and I'm the Curator of Art at the Springfield Museums, which is home to the amazing world of Dr. Seuss. When we have the opportunity to see an illustrator like Andrew at work, an opportunity that we've had today, we have the chance to really see the world through his eyes or even through Dr. Seuss's eyes. And it's so wonderful that artists often helped us help us to observe and understand our surroundings differently to gain a new perspective. We're grateful for that. And the Dr. Seuss Museums, or I'm sorry, the Dr. Seuss Horse Museum book reminds us that artists have really been seeing and depicting all sorts of things in many, many different ways for centuries, including, of course, horses. 
And so I'm so pleased to be with you today to share a few works of art from the collection in Springfield. And we'll see that artists all over the world have envisioned horses as majestic models, as fearless warriors, athletic runners, and stately steeds. So let's go ahead and dive in. We can begin by looking at one of the Springfield Museum's most distinguished bronze sculptures of a horse. And this is a sculpture that's attributed to the Italian artist Luigi Valadier, who lived in Rome during the 18th century. The sculpture is one of absolute anatomical precision. So if you look closely, you can see this horse's every muscle. And veterinarians who have studied the piece have been able to identify elements of the horse's skeletal and circulatory systems. Quite amazing. In creating this sculpture, which is actually believed to have been copied from an earlier model, the artist participated in a long tradition of artistry that really understood this serious and exacting study of living things as necessary for the creation of realist drawing and of sculpture. And this bronze horse actually bears similarities to drawings created by the famous artist Leonardo da Vinci, whose interest in the natural world led him to create detailed sketches of animals and humans. And these were sketches that took into account things like proportion and movement, which you see exhibited in the bronze sculpture of the horse. And these similarities between da Vinci's sketches and the horse at the Springfield Museums were actually so similar that at one time, this bronze horse sculpture was falsely attributed to da Vinci himself. And today this horse greets everybody who walks up the central staircase at the Damore Museum of Fine Arts at the Springfield Museums. I hope that if you are ever in our neighborhood, you'll come to visit and say hello to our wonderful bronze horse. So while this artist and many others were fascinated by the three-dimensional form and the anatomy of a horse, some artists translated 3D horses into two-dimensional work. So let's look at a next piece. That's exactly what Japanese artist Utagawa Kuniyoshi did in 1827 when he created this wonderfully bright and stylized woodblock print. Notice the bold flat colors and this energetic composition. It appears as though the warrior and his horse are just hurtling towards us at incredible speed. And the horse and the rider fill the composition. They fill the space on the page, coming from the top right to the bottom left corner of the work, exaggerating their scale and their power. And imaginative compositions and bold colors like the ones that you see in this print are really hallmarks of Japanese woodblock printmaking in which many blocks of wood were carved to create a sort of stamp for every different color. And so each woodblock is a product of really thoughtful design and expert execution intended to be produced over and over again. Kuniyoshi was a master of woodblock print design. And he's best known for prints that portray samurai heroes and warriors, like the print that we see here. This is from a series that was sort of Kuniyoshi's breakout series, the first one that made him famous. It was called the 108 Heroes of the Soikuden, and it was based on a 14th century Chinese novel. These prints were commissioned to illustrate the adventures of over 100 rebels who fought to protect common people against the powers of a corrupt government. The heroes of the Soikuden were sometimes compared to the European folklore hero Robin Hood, who of course stole from the rich and gave to the poor, because they too were protecting people who were powerless. And in this print, we see one of those wonderful bandit heroes just hurtling forward on his horse. And there's incredible energy and dynamism. So it might not be a surprise to you that the, hor the horses and the heroes in this story have now in the 21st century actually been made into action-packed video games. So let's look at another print in which the 3D horse is translated into two dimensions. During the same century in which Kuniyoshi was working, but halfway across the world. New York City-based printmakers Nathaniel Courier and James Merritt Ives were also creating these two-dimensional pictures of horses. 
they were using the then, then very, very new and innovative process of lithography, which allowed them to produce even more prints in a quicker time period than the woodblock printmaking technique would have. But this print and others by Courier Knives had a similar sort of popular appeal to the series and the prints by Kuniyoshi that we looked at, at the on the last slide. So this print is called The Leaders. And in producing this print, Nathaniel Courier and James Ives capitalized on the popularity of horse racing as a spectator sport. Owning a racehorse was pretty expensive and it would have been reserved for the wealthiest members of society in the 19th century. But almost anybody could go to a racetrack, bet on a horse, and maybe even purchase a print or a picture of their favorite equine champion. And so Courier Knives captured and marketed the heyday of the horse through depictions of races, favorite thoroughbreds, and of course, racetracks. And of the nearly 8,000 prints that Courier and I've made in the firm's really long career of printmaking, over 750 were related to horse racing. So you can tell just how popular these images of horses were. And this wonderfully dramatic print showcases the energetic and fierce uh, celebrated horses of the day. We see JIC, Mod S, and St. Julian, and their names are on the bottom of the print written below the words, the leaders. And we know that they established different track records and were really famous in their day. JIC was actually known as the Little Black Whirlwind and he was the first trotter to race a mile in two minutes and 10 seconds. We know that Courier Knives oversaw a staff of artists who helped them to design every print. They produced so many that the two business leaders of the firm couldn't be directly involved in every single print. But in this case, we see that the staff artist who was assigned to this print chose to depict the three horses together. They're neck and neck as if sprinting towards the finish line. And each, each horse has their mouth open, um, their eyes are wide, but they're also distinguished by coloration and slightly by expression. And so the result is really a, a portrait of these three horses. It's one that distinguishes them, but also communicates the energy and the power of each animal while evoking that visceral excitement that one might have if they were going to become a spectator of the sport on race day. So it's a really wonderful dynamic portrait of three quite amazing horses. And the last work that we'll look at today was also inspired by the racetrack. You can see that work here. French painter Jean-Louis Forain, who is behind this work, was a leading member of the artistic movement called Impressionism, in which painters rejected tight academic realist style in favor of loose brush strokes and spontaneous impressions of modern life. And working in a circle of very experimental artists like Edouard Benet and Edgar Degas, Forain frequented cafes, the opera, and of course the racetrack seeking source material for his paintings, which were really all about daily life. And as the book Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum reminds us, Impressionist artists often tried to capture a moment in time, so their paintings have this slightly soft or out of focus appearance. And we do see that here. This painting, which was created in 1905 or right around that date, depicts the Longchamp race course in Paris, which opened in 1857. And by the time Forain was frequenting it in the early 1900s, it had become a very popular gathering place for sport, but also for socialization. And although we see fencing, we see horses, we see a jockey in a very bright orange jacket in the background, we notice when we take this picture in as a whole that the subject of the work is not so much the action of the sport, but instead really the atmosphere of the place and the spectators themselves. 
So if we think back to looking at that Courier Knives print that was on the last slide, and we compare these two, we see that the Courier Knives print had emphasized the exertion of the horses and their excellence by zooming in on their faces. But Forain really zooms out. He allows us to observe everything in the scene, and especially this really fashionably dressed duo who are in the foreground, and they're almost completely framed by green grass. They're engaged in conversation, and they seem to be unaware of the painter nearby. These two spectators and the very idea of spectating have become the focus of this painting. So next time that you visit a museum, I certainly encourage you to look for depictions of horses. My guess is that you'll find more than a few um, because horses often appear in art. And this is something that each of the artists that we looked at today remind us of. Horses are so important to art because they were so important to human experience throughout history and throughout different cultures. I hope you've enjoyed this quick dive into the world of art and horses and also into the collections at the Springfield Museums. It's been so much fun to talk through these works with you. Thank you all for joining us. And at this point, I'm pleased to open our question and answer segment of the program. We have a few questions lined up for Andrew already. So let's dive into those. Um, Andrew, I'm so curious as a, a segue between museums and Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum. While you were illustrating the book, did you visit museums in order to study different works of art? Um, or how did you look at or think about the pieces that are represented in the book? Yeah, uh, thanks, Maggie. Um, I did. I visited my local museum, the Art Gallery of South Australia, which does have some horse, actually has a very prominent horse art in the first room, quite a controversial uh, piece of horse art because I can't remember the name of the artist. It's a contemporary artist. And it's a bit Damien Hursty, the piece. It's this sort of horse carcass um, that's been, there were several horse carcasses that have been made into this kind of grotesque sculpture. Um, and it sat in the middle of the gallery in amongst all of these historical painting of um, horses. So it's got quite a lot of impact. Um, and it's funny that, yeah, the, how important, again, that's, you know, different from the horse museum, obviously, but using the figure of the horse to comment on art history. Um, but so I did look at that gallery. Um, I kind of got a, wanted to get a sense of what crowds look like in a gallery. Um, when I went in there, it's not so much just the artworks, but the people who are looking at artworks. Um, so I actually watched, I don't know if you know the Frederick Wiseman documentary, National Gallery, um, about the National Gallery in London. So I watched that and sat with my sketch pad, just randomly drawing people as it went on. I just wanted to get a feel for what it's like to be in a museum. Um, I didn't there were none of the works that were in the Dr. Zeus's Horse Museum were in local galleries here. But after the book had come out, I did go to, uh, and I visited New York. I went to the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And I've got to say that museum, that is just like hit after hit. There are so many, like, you can't believe it when you're walking through there, all the different artworks. And there were quite a few artworks that were from Dr. Zeus's Horse Museum that I uh, got to see there. And it was really, it was quite a, that again, a surreal experience. I've said that a few times, but it was quite surreal to see these actual artworks in real life that I'd just seen in books for, you know, for so long. Um, yes. Great, thank you. Yes, I mean, we're, we're here at the Springfield Museum surrounded by wonderful artwork and illustrations. And it's a good place to go to source inspiration from the work, but also to people watch. <laughs> so it's interesting yeah, yeah. to hear you say that you were yeah. looking at the environment as well as at the works themselves, which you can actually see in the Horse Museum. You have figures um, admiring works of art in all sorts of ways. And I think even one of the figures in your book is drawing a piece that he sees in a museum. Oh yeah, I did really want to connect it to, yeah, that's one thing I wanted to do in the book is I wanted to connect it to children's creativity too, their response. Because I love when you go into a museum, into any museum or art gallery, often there's school groups going through 
And it's so fun to see the kids drawing and sketching while you're in there. Um, and I kind of wanted to get that connection as well as children making art while being inspired by art as well. Right, absolutely. Um, another question which is related and this, uh, your answer could have to do specifically with the Horse Museum or with other illustrations. Um, Adele Fisk asks, where do you find inspiration for your illustrations? And this can be in general or in a more specific case, however you'd like to answer. Well, yeah, I often, I'm not really a big sketcher. Well, I said I did sketch for um, the Horse Museum. Uh, in general, I find it's often from reading, from reading the manuscript and just by drawing, you find the inspiration. I don't sort of sit and wait for inspiration to spark. I just um, sort of start drawing and often the inspiration will emerge on the page through the process of, um, I do love, that's what I love about illustrating is you're working with uh, stories and things like that and characters and uh, authors. And I think it is that connection to reading that I really love. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, because it's, it's, I guess it's different from other art forms in that you're sort of really connected to a text when you're making an illustration. So often I'm inspired, yeah, I guess by the actual text, by literature or um, poetry or things like that. I also, I do really love uh, looking at other artworks, probably more so than looking at photos or looking at, um, you know, the world around me. Um, sounds a bit depressing, but I, I do love looking at actually already made artworks. And often, even if I don't draw like that or, or make a picture that looks like that, I'll often find um, that another artwork or seeing how another artist has looked at something will really just inspire my own imagination. Absolutely. And I have a good follow-up question to that, um, which is, do you have a favorite artist or illustrator? And, and hearing you speak about your inspiration made me think, well, maybe the best question would be, um, if not a favorite artist or illustrator, a favorite author. Oh, yeah, wow. Um, well, uh, I have lots, it's hard to pick favorites. Um, <laughs> You know, what really, in, when I was young, and I think it's still a favourite, uh, I really loved the classic New Yorker cartoonists. And, and I think a lot of the artists and illustrators I like have a background in cartooning. I don't know, it's something about those, uh, that art form that I really love. I really love the single panel cartoons. I love people like Charles Adams, who did, invented the Adams family, uh, Peter Arno, Victoria Roberts, who's Australian, but lives in, um, in New York. Um, and... William Steig especially too. And what I love about them is they can create, much like Dr. Zeus, a whole universe and such a unique universe in just one picture. Um, and that's, I find that it, there's so, you know, certainly a lot of New Yorker cartoonists were able to do that. Like George Booth, I can I think of so many. And I always wish or I would hope to achieve something like that in my own work. I don't know if I can, but um, that's sort of what I'm striving for. I'm always, you know, striving, I guess, when I'm making something. You always have an ambition beyond, I guess, what you've already made. Um, well, I do anyway. Um, and I guess that's my long-term ambition. Right, absolutely. No, that's so interesting to hear. Um, and we have a couple of other questions. We have uh, Jenny Powers asking, how did you prepare for your career as an illustrator, which I think, you know, you've talked to us a lot about. You actually studied English literature, yeah. um, but I wondered if there were any other unexpected experiences that prepared you in some way for this career that you've now taken on um, and have done such a wonderful job with in finishing Dr. Seuss's manuscript. Uh, yeah, I don't, it's hard to think. Often, one thing I do is I'll often think of anything I'm making as something other than a book or an illustrated book. Um, I'll think of it as an animation or I'll think of it as a game or um, I guess it's a kind of trick um, to try and make yourself uh, create something is to try and think of it as something different. Um, it's sort of even like a dance routine. I'm not. I'm no dancer, but um, uh, I, I still sometimes even a book I was working on the other day. I tried to look at the pages as sort of like sequences in a 
routine, like a musical number or a dance routine or, or something like that. It just helps me, I think, be a little bit more inventive. I remember an author told me um, really early on when I was working on a picture book that um, she was giving me some advice and she said, I want the book to feel like a surprise with each page turn. Um, and that advice has really stuck with me. And I've even read some things that Dr. Zeus says, which are similar to that, like you've got to keep the, the flow of the story going. And some of that is obviously having the same consistent characters, but it's also about making, I guess, each page kind of surprising. And you certainly see that in Dr. Zeus's work and a lot of other illustrators that I like. You turn a page and it's a very surprising image a lot of the time keeps it feeling fresh and new and, and exciting, I think, to continue turning those pages. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Story. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, a few more questions here. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you have a favorite type of museum or a favorite museum that you've been to? You talked about loving looking at artworks and um, also loving looking at cartoons so I wondered if there's a, a museum or a place of inspiration that you go to well look one museum that, that this might sound a little pretentious this answer but I have to say the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice I really love um, I've been there twice it could help that it's in Venice which is a city that I love but um, it's I just it's a small museum quite small and um, it's got a very um, uh, so I guess a, like a relatively narrow collection of modern art. It doesn't have a vast range. I did love the Met in um, New York, but that's I went there once. You, I know why they give you a ticket for three days because it would take a long time to go through that whole museum. But yeah, the Peggy Guggenheim I really love. I do like small museums. I don't know why. Um, I guess I find them easier to take it all in. Um, and I do love my local art gallery of South Australia. It's a really great museum. And there's next door to it is our, uh, also our South Australian Museum, which I loved as a kid because I had this um, Egyptian room at the top of these stairs with a, um, an actual mummy in there. And that was very exciting when you were a kid. I, I mean, I love museums in general. So I feel there's so many more museums in the world I've got to visit. So it's, uh, you know, they're provisional favorites for the moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you've given us some great museum suggestions. So uh, <laughs> when we're able to, we'll all have to do a world tour and right. wonderful places. It sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand yeah. what you mean about needing the time to take in and, and digest museums that are really large. Sometimes a few days is the way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one last question for this evening, and I think it's an appropriate one to close on. Do you have a favorite Dr. Seuss character? Um, look, I really do. I really did love the cat in the hat when I was young and I still do. And that was probably the one that really influenced my approach to the horse museum. Just the way with the sort of like long hose pipe arms. I mean, I like, I really like Sam uh, from Green Eggs and Ham, uh, the great character. I also really love, um, I don't know, it's probably not his most well, but certainly not, He's most well known, but it was from, I think, 10 Tall Tales. And is that what it's called? Let me have a look. It's called, I've got it here, 10 Tall Tales. Um, and it was this uh, little story in there called What Was I Scared Of? About this, the narrator is scared of these floating pants. And I really loved <laughs> that story. And I loved reading it to my kids too. Um, they really liked it. And I can relate to that little narrator, sort of, you know. Um, it, it seems to relate to adult worries sometimes, <laughs> that uh, character. Um, so maybe it's sort of slipped up to the top in uh, top of the list in my mind as I've gone into adulthood. Um, but yeah, I guess long term, I do really love the cat in the hat. <laughs> a classic answer and a few new characters for maybe some of us yeah. to investigate. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. We are coming thank to the you, of our program, but this has been so much fun to hear from you about your sources of inspiration, your relationship with Dr. Seuss, and your process of illustrating Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum. We're so, so pleased to have been able to spend the time with you, and I want to express the Springfield Museum's gratitude to you and to Random House um, and to everybody who tunes into this program. So thank you again, Andrew. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Thank you, Kay, too. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone.